Welcome to the Road to 100 Million in Real Estate podcast, where you'll benefit from the opportunity to learn to become a skillful real estate investor. You'll get guidance from top industry producers, operators, and investors who are eager to help you learn from their proven strategies of success. Now to your host, Dorrance Constant. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Dorrance Constant. Today, I've got John Kasman on the show. John, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Dorrance. How are you, man? I can't complain. Happy to have you on. Before I jump in, John, I just want to tell them a little bit about you. See, John is a real estate entrepreneur who controls a portfolio worth over $58 million as a general partner. He's the leader of Kasman Capital Group. He's the co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit, a no-pinch event to connect like-minded professor, I mean, investors. And John also hosts the weekly real estate podcast, Target Market Insight, where he speaks to industry leaders about the best emerging markets, marketing tips, and investing insights. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me. I'm excited, man. You've got a great story. I really want to hear you talk about why you got into real estate and how's it impacted your life? Yeah, man. So I love real estate. And for me, you know, it was one of those things that I had to figure out. I loved it, right? So mm-hmm. starting out, you know, as as a young kid and growing up, you know, money was always a little bit tight and you started to learn a little bit about how money works, but you couldn't quite figure it out. At least I couldn't, but I would ask my dad certain questions and, you know, just trying to figure out different things. Fast forward, you know, I started to read a little bit more, read a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that really unlocked the key for me as far as understanding assets, liabilities, the way money flows in and flows out. So fast forward from there, I was always intrigued by real estate at that point, but didn't quite know how to start investing. I ended up taking a job out of college, working in marketing and advertising. I did really good work and essentially my client hired me to work directly for them, which was an automotive company at that time. And so I went there, of course, 2007 happened, 2008. And the economic downturn, so a lot of people got let go. I unfor- or I fortunately was not one of those individuals. Mm-hmm. But in watching that, it reinforced the importance of really creating my own life and not relying solely on a corporate job. No matter what job you have, no matter how good it is or what company it is, you know, it's not a guarantee. And for me, I watched people who had put 20, 30 years into a job for a company who that was their plan. That was their plan A. Their plan B and their plan C uh, was that company, and when the, you know those things happen, they really didn't have uh, anywhere to turn. So I watched that happen, and I think at that moment it really crystallized that I needed something else. Started to invest in real estate. I ended up moving to Chicago. I bought a duplex. I turned that into you know I bought another three unit building. We bought an eight unit building. Started flipping a couple properties, and at that moment I really wanted to scale and figure out how I could go larger. Now, at the same time, I was still working full time. Mm. So this was good to kind of build this portfolio while I was working. But but ultimately, started to realize, hey, listen, there's something here. It's working extremely well for us. It's giving us a lot of flexibility in our lifestyle. How do we actually take this to the next level? And that's where we started to turn into multifamily syndication. Okay, so you got into syndication. Now, in that process, you mentioned that you had a full-time job. You were doing, you are a marketer. How did help your, how did you leverage that to start going into real estate investing? Yes, it's a great question. You know, marketing is one of those things that we call a transferable skill, right? If you know how to do certain things, regardless of the industry, that's going to be a talent or a skill set that you can leverage in other aspects of your life or your business. So marketing is one of those things. Now, obviously, there's a big difference from advertising a $40,000 vehicle to, you know, you know, working with investors or kind of building up your personal brand. But the, the principles are the same, right? It's about awareness. You know, the people know who you are. If they are aware of you, what are their thoughts of you? Are they negative? Are they neutral? Are, is it positive, right? How can you change that? How can you impact that? How can you create a better image for yourself? So there's the brand building aspects of it, right? Which is about communication and connecting with people and getting your message out there. But ultimately, it's really about what's in it for me. You know, marketing really comes down to as a consumer, you know, if you don't have a product or solution to a problem that I have, I don't care. So ultimately, you have to understand what the problem is that they're having. Sometimes they can't articulate it. You know, sometimes they don't know what the problem is or something that they're dealing with, but the solution is not obvious. So they're not really looking for a solution. You know, think about it. If you are, you know, I I used to ride the train into Chicago all the time, right? So in Chicago, 
I ride the train. Well, I had this idea. I would hate not getting a seat because if I didn't get a seat, then I couldn't read a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can. I mean, some people can like stand and not hold on to a rail. I had to hold on to a rail. So I couldn't read a book, hold on to a rail and do all that at one time. Right. So for me, it was like that was an issue. Now, I could come with a solution to bring a chair onto the train myself, but obviously that's not as practical, right? But that's the thing, right? The first part is identifying the problem and then figuring out the solve. That's why, you know, for me in that instance, Audible became a great solution. You know, instead of trying to physically hold the book while I'm in the middle of a busy train with people knocking you around, you know, just putting an audio book on was the solution for that problem, right? So it's finding different ways like that as a marketer to figure out what is the problem that people are having and how do you drive solutions and with this with multifamily i realized that a lot of people love the benefits who doesn't want passive income who doesn't want money just showing up in their bank account right, right. money showing up in the bank account saving on taxes creating diversified portfolios i mean those are things that many people want i don't know anyone who doesn't want those things the challenge is the amount of effort and work that it takes to educate yourself build a portfolio find the right people, find the right deals, and then manage it, manage the tenants, the headaches that come with being a landlord. Those are the things that people, they don't see the value in that. So how do we solve that? And that's where multifamily syndication becomes a great aspect. Right. And I love that you are able to recognize the transferable skills that you've had in your in your current path. Because sometimes when folks are moving into something new, let's say real estate investing, as we're talking about, it's like, how do I identify you know, what I'm good at here, then transfer it over and you man should do those. So that's huge. So for a lot of folks who are listening, you know, a lot of the questions that you were asking are, are some questions that we should be asking ourselves to be moving into real estate or whatever it is, frankly, because uh, a lot of times we don't want to take for granted the skill sets that we have. Yeah. You know, I think you should do a kind of an internal, you know, look and ask yourself a couple of questions. One, what do you love? to what are you good at? And hopefully they're the same things, all right? Or you have some things on that list that align and you can take something that you love and you're good at. And that's the thing you really want to focus in on, right? You don't have to be great at everything. Most of us are not. Like some people will never be a great uh, numbers guy or underwriter. Some people will never be great raising capital or or talking to investors because it's just not something they're really comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But there's probably something that you do that is transferable because multifamily is so broad. I mean, think about it. There's everything from finding a deal to negotiating to raising capital to working with tenants to construction to budgeting to finance and legal and, you know, so many aspects of it that there has to be something in that space that you're probably pretty good at and you enjoy that could be transferable if you want to get into multifamily real estate, whether it be syndication or just multifamily in general, there's probably something you enjoy that would have some skills that were transferable into the multifamily landscape. Right. So let's talk about how you did it. Let's first talk about what is your business model and amongst your team, what is your role within the team? Yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple of things that I do. I'm an asset manager as well as being kind of investor relations an asset manager, what that means is basically I'm overseeing the property management team. So on some deals, I do that. On other deals, I don't. But typically, that entails you know reaching out to the property manager, checking reports, scheduling consistent calls, going over operations, making sure the business plan is being implemented, and then helping to oversee any challenges that may arise in the business, right? So that's the asset manager piece of it. As far as investor relations, that's everything from finding investors to educating them on deals that we have to getting them set up to invest in the deals and then ongoing communications once we're actually invested in a deal. So those are kind of the two main primary things that I do. And in some capacities, I help find deals and do other aspects as well. But I think the key there is really just, you know, building out all the aspects of asset management and investor relations. Those are kind of the primary elements. Right. And so with your marketing experience, how do you leverage that to gain more, gain investors for your deals? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, um, having to step back because people knew me as a marketer. And I think that anyone who's listening to this, if you haven't done a syndication or you haven't invested, people in your network are going to know you for what they know, right? They're going to know you as my friend from college or the buddy I went to 
you know, this wedding with or whatever, right? That's who they know you as. So to just pop up one day and be a multifamily syndicator is going to be a little bit odd for, for people to take that in. So I think the first thing you have to do is really start to educate people on your interest in multifamily, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you're looking for, the impact it's going to have, the benefits it's going to have for you and for others. So I think that was really the first step was letting people know, hey, listen, you know, I've been investing in real estate for the last, and I think at that point it was like six years or something like that, five or six years, and I've enjoyed it. Here's the portfolio that we have, and we've decided to scale up into larger multifamily. So at that moment, I already had a one and a half million dollar portfolio and a personal portfolio between my wife and I. And at that moment, we decided, you know, we were going to go into multifamily syndication. The first step was just telling people, hey, we love real estate. Here's what real estate has been able to do for us. And here's where we plan on going forward. And there's going to be an opportunity to work with other people like yourself. If you're busy, if you're already working 40 plus hours a week and you love the idea of real estate, you love the idea of multifamily, but you don't want to be a landlord and you don't want to sacrifice your time with your family or sacrifice your vacations to deal with tenants or those kind of things, let's take the benefits of it and let's not deal with some of those drawbacks and you can invest passively with us on some of the deals that we're doing. So I think part of it is also just educating people on what the opportunity is, what you're doing and why you're doing it in the first place. Oh, that's fantastic. And when you were putting out that message, how did you measure the effectiveness of it? How many people respond? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, depending on how you do it, there's a lot of ways you can do that, right? You can pick up the phone, you can text people, you can call people, you can email people. I think you want to put together a plan and start to execute that plan. You know, some folks will respond right away. If I could go back, there are things I would definitely do differently. But, you know, ultimately, it's always going to be a little rough when you're starting out because you're, you may not be 100% confident in yourself. And that's okay. You know, the wealth and the opportunity, that's all going to be in the places where we're uncomfortable. So you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And if you can do that, and even if your message is a little, you know, I don't want to say scattered, but if it's not as clear, if it's not as strong and compelling, it's okay. Like the first step is to talk to people. You have to get it out there. You have to tell people. And then you start to respond. You know, maybe you only get three people who say, yep, I'd be interested in doing that with you. But that's okay. That's three people you didn't have before you started talking, right? And then you just refine your message. You understand what they didn't like about it. You know, ask for feedback. And you don't necessarily have to say, hey, what do you think? But if someone says they're not interested or they didn't respond or they say, hey, the time's not right, then I think that's an opportunity to probe for feedback. Well, hey, what would make it right? What could what would a deal need to look like for you to be interested in investing, right? So those are open opportunities to probe and you can get feedback but then also understand who is your investor, what do they look for, and grow from there. Some of these people just are not going to be your investors. You know, I think one mistake that I made starting out, and I hope your listeners uh, really take this point to home, but one mistake that I made starting out was expecting the people in my network to be the investors who would come into my deals. Now, a lot of people, almost everyone I know, they tell you to start with your personal network. And it's true. You absolutely should. You absolutely must. But just because someone is your friend does not mean they're going to be your investor. Okay. And ultimately, you can continue to try to pound that against the wall. But at some point, a better strategy, and this is an evolved strategy, is they'll find the people who actually want to invest, who are interested in investing, and attract those people to you. It's the difference between pushing your message and pulling your message. Push pull strategies, going back to marketing. Sales is more of a push. Marketing is more of a, of a pull, right? You want to pull people to you. People who are interested in your message, they'll come to you. Instead of trying to convince your grandma or your auntie to invest in your multifamily deal, grandma's not interested. She doesn't get it. It's complicated, whatever. There's plenty of people who are interested. You may be better suited to spend your time and energy trying to talk to those people than trying to convince someone who doesn't, doesn't understand what you're trying to say. I think those are uh, awesome points. You know, you started off by educating folks, determining what some of their problems really are, because sometimes their problems are not what you're able to solve at the current moment, but getting an idea of what those problems are. So in the future, if you potentially have a product, you can actually service them. So let's talk about this 
So we we get some of these folks that are maybe not interested at the current moment. Maybe we don't have the proper solutions for them, and that's okay. But what do you do to keep them engaged once they at least enter, you know, your world? Yeah. So I mean, one big tip for your listeners here is you want to create a CRM system. Okay, that's a customer relationship marketing system. That could be anything from a piece of paper <laughs> to Excel to their systems online like Pipe Drive, Contactually, Constant Contact. You know, there's a ton of them, but there's a lot of different ones that are out there that you can use. So I would say you want to create something there and you want to track all of the folks who are in your network who have some interest, some level of interest. And if they're not interested, let's say you have a conversation with a potential investor or someone in your network and they say, hey, that sounds great. I'd love some extra income, but you know, I don't really have the money sitting aside to invest right now, but keep me in mind in the future. In that case, what you may say, or even if they don't say keep me in mind, they just say, hey, you know, it sounds cool, but time is not right. What you may want to do is say, hey, is it cool if I put you on my email list? And that way I can just give you updates. You can kind of keep track of what's going on. And so if we do have a deal that makes sense later on down the road, you can see that and, you know, we can discuss it if it makes sense at that time. Most of the time people will say, yes, that's fine. Keep me on the email list. So that's one way to keep them engaged and stay top of mind whenever you have deals in the future, but also just keep them engaged because while they may not have a deal, maybe they know someone else who's interested in it. And I think ultimately you still want to build your network because, and I got an email like this morning, someone said, hey, you know, I'm not in a position to invest in your next deal, but I'll pass this along to a couple of people who I do know. And it's not a deal. It's just, I just let them know, hey, we just closed on a deal. Let me know if you're interested in the next one. So he just sent me a note saying, hey, I'll pass that along to other folks who knows. So that's the kind of thing where you want to continue to engage people, even though you may not see them as an immediate investor, they may have other people that they know that they can refer you to and you can build relationships with them. I think those are wonderful points. So we're keeping, we're not just, throwing anyone by the wayside because they're not ready to jump on the deal now. We're keeping them engaged, keeping um, in contact with them so we can remain uh, top of mind when they may have a problem that we could potentially solve. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about deals. What are you looking for in deals these days? Yeah. So we focus on value-add investment deals, right? So when we say value-add, what we're looking for is a property that is cash flowing day one. So it's stable. It's probably 85 to... 95% occupied, and it's making money day one, but the units are kind of outdated, or maybe the utilities are kind of high, or the expense to ratio, the expense to income ratio is pretty high, or something like that, right? So, we're looking for an opportunity to create more value. Think about it as kind of like a private equity firm or venture capitalist who sees an existing business that's doing okay, doing well, but it could be doing so much better if they made a couple tweaks here and there, right? That's kind of the approach we're coming and taking. So I'm looking for properties like that where we can make upgrades to the property. We can increase the NOI, that is the net operating income. So uh, we're looking for opportunities to make more money in the property. And then because commercial properties are valued based on the NOI, if we're able to do that, we increase the value of the property. So not only are we getting more cash flow, but we're also increasing the value of the property, which means if we go to refi or we go to exit, then we're going to make more money on the back end of the return. Right. And it, over the past few years, let's say last uh, past 2011, it's been a lot easier to find those kind of deals. But it seems that the things are getting a little bit more tight. What, what are you doing to find those kind of deals these days? And are there anything that you're doing that's creative to be in that space? Well, I think it depends on the size of deals you're looking at, right? If you are looking in, let's say, I call them small to mid-sized deals. So let's say... I mean, commercial starts at five units, so let's say five to 50 or five to 75. If you're looking at that unit range, you can get a little bit creative. You can try to go direct to owners. You can do direct mail. You can try different strategies and tactics. When you get above 75, those things don't tend to work quite as much because the brokers really own the bulk of those relationships and the sellers are very sophisticated. So you're not going to run into situations where on a 200 unit apartment complex, somebody just decides to sell it based on a postcard they received, right? I mean, they're probably not even getting a postcard. And, you know, they know, they kind of know the game. They know the value of the property. They know how to get the most amount of value out of it versus someone who owns a 20 unit. They are certainly savvy, 
But if it's making money for them, that's all they care about. They don't care about what the market value is. Um, they just care about, you know, what they can get. And you may be able to talk to them and maybe they don't feel like dealing with a broker and maybe they self-managed and, you know, really don't want to deal with other people. So you may be able to get those individuals and talk to them one-on-one versus kind of going through the broker route. So I think it depends on the size deal you're looking for. If you're looking for something 75 units or less, I think you can try things where you're going directly to the sellers. Direct mail is a great uh, starting point. Facebook is a great thing to do. Skip tracing where you can go and look up the property owners, find the LLC, figure out who owns the LLC, get an email, get a phone number and try to reach out to them that way. That's another phenomenal strategy and tactic. But ultimately, it's still going to come down to building rapport and building confidence with that owner, right? Um, that's going to be the best way to do it. On the larger stuff, what you're really looking to do is build a relationship with those brokers. And that's the first thing you want to do. You can try to go around the brokers, but again, I the brokers are going to have the lion's share of the deals and leads. So I would start there. You can work with property managers and other professionals who have direct relationships. A lot of property management companies also own their own property. So you can't find out, hey, is there anything in your portfolio you're looking to sell? You can just understand what's going on and say and approach them directly on stuff like that. So that's another approach as well. But typically brokers, and I would say just really building strong broker relationships, staying top of mind, getting in front of them, being credible. I think the bottom line, if you want to do deals in today's market where it's very competitive, and there's a lot of people looking to get into this space, you have to be credible. Um, a seller, if you go off market, that's what he's looking for. Do I believe this person can actually buy from me? If you go to a broker, do I believe this person will actually buy and close the deal? So you have to be credible. It's a really important aspect of buying and investing, especially in today's competitive climate. And, and that's a good point. Being being credible, being in a space where you can actually close on a deal because your reputation is so is huge in this business, right? Now, also with current market decisions and possibility of going, you know, having a, a correction or downturn or whatever folks want to call it these days, what are some key metrics that you've got to see in a deal in order to move forward with it? Well, I mean, I think when you talk about a downturn, the first thing is it won't be like 2008, right? I don't think it'll be that bad because the, the rest of the economy doesn't seem to be in the same situation that it was back then. So I think that's the first part of it. So the second part of it is you have to protect yourself and be careful. I think the biggest piece to it is the loan that you get and understanding the your options based on that loan. So getting longer term loans, they help because you don't have to worry about you know, what's going to happen in three years or two years or four years, you've locked into a long-term loan. With that said, you know, interest rates continue to drop. You know, we just got an interest rate in the threes on a property that we acquired last week. So interest rates continue to drop. So the downside of locking in long-term debt is, you know, if interest rates continue to drop, you know, you're going to be paying a, a higher interest rate than what you could be paying in the future. With that said, if you are going to go with, let's call it a bridge loan or something that is more flexible, then what you really want to make sure is that it's not just a one-year loan. You want to make sure that you have as long term, as long as you can get. So if it's a three plus one or five-year, basically five-year loan with two uh, one-year renewals, I would suggest that heavily versus getting something where you only have 12 months and then trying to refinance. And the reason is you don't know at what point you're going to finish or if you need an extension and the banks may get tight when it comes to refinancing. And then keep in mind, if the interest rates drop, you have to look at the cap rate. So the value of the property that may change based on a lot of these factors too, because if, if the money is cheap, then people are going to want to pay more of a premium. But if they start going up, then people won't be willing to pay a premium for the property. So the way they value that property may change. If you need to bring 70% LTV to a deal for the refinance, then that may put you in a tough position. So there's a couple of things you need to really watch out for. It's probably a little more complicated than I can dive super deep into. But I would say the loan is the big thing that I would look at in today's market. Right. In fact, if we even look back in the past when, it, when things were you know, super difficult post-2007, a lot of the property values have gone up since then. So if someone was able to hold on to their property values, I mean, sorry, hold on to the property, they could have still made it out really well. But what happened back then was, was folks were taking loans where were not as favorable um, with it, when market conditions hit you know, a downturn. 
That's exactly it, right? I mean, so to to your point, let's just assume, let's assume it's 2006, right? And we take out a three-year bridge loan, all right? 2009 comes, not a great time to be either refinancing or selling the property, right? So that's really where you get hit because the value of the property in 2009 is not where it could or should be. So that's what you have to watch out for. Now, if you had a 10-year loan, and you had to sell in 2015, 2016, you would have been absolutely fine. You would have been fine. Uh, I would say the other side of that coin is making sure, and at least this is our strategy. So I know folks do a lot of different strategies and a lot of stuff works. Um, but for us, that's also why we focus on value add in properties that are cash flowing day one, because I can always pump the brakes on renovations. I can always accelerate renovations. But the bottom line is we're making money day one. So I'm not worried about not making money. The only time I really have to worry about the value of the property is the day I buy it and then the day I refinance it and the day I sell it, if I refinance, right? Those are only three days that matters. The only, every other day that we own it, what matters is the cash flow. How much money are we making? How many bills do we need to pay? That's it. That's what matters. And if we can focus on increasing the operations, keep maintaining occupancy, things of that nature, that's what's really going to make or break the deal. As long as you have a loan in place that gives you that flexibility. Fantastic. I think that was a key metric um, that our listeners to pay attention to. Now, what are you working on these days that that's really exciting you? Yeah, man. So we've, you know, we've had a lot of success, a lot of good growth, and we're starting to work with other people now. So we're actually getting ready to launch. Uh, actually, by the time this comes out, we're launching our consulting program and we're helping other investors who are looking to come out and really not just the multifamily stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm happily sharing information on the multifamily apartment syndication, things like that. But what I found is most people really need help with the marketing aspects of things. How do you actually attract capital? How do you become credible in front of a broker? How do you get partners if you need partners to bring you the net worth and liquidity or to help you with asset management? It's those aspects that I see a lot of people struggling with. You know, you can read about syndication in books or, or multifamily investing in books or podcasts. And I think that, you know, savvy people can get that. But what's not available in a readily, you know, consumable platform is the, the marketing. How do you actually become someone who can attract capital? And then also just how do you build your brand? How do you start to do your first deal? You know, because you can know all this and still not be able to find a deal that makes sense. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? If, you know, you become credible when you do deals. So you can't do deals unless you're credible. So how do you overcome that hump, right? So that's kind of what we're helping people with now is, you know, becoming credible, doing more deals, understanding how to attract capital and really helping them launch into the multifamily space. So we'll definitely cover all the, the multifamily basics and things like that. But I think the real value is learning from someone who's done marketing for you know, Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 500 companies, small corporations, influencers, really understanding how to build your personal brand to be credible and attract capital for your investing. Fantastic. And what's one uh, habit that's helped you become successful? I will tell you, you know, uh, there are a couple habits. The one that I would say is the most important is reflection. You know, whenever we have a good week, you take a minute and look at the week. Whenever we have a bad week, which Usually are fewer and far in between, but we do have some rough days here from time to time. But we try to take a look at it and we reflect, hey, what worked? What didn't work? You know, why didn't it work? And we try to do that daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and just journaling that. You know, just take a minute, write it down. And it doesn't have to be a long thing. It could just simply be, hey, what is my goal for the day? And then at the end of the day, did you accomplish it or not? What is my goal for the week? Did I accomplish it or not? Same thing throughout the, you know, the quarter and whatnot. And I think that's really helped just getting clarity on what it is you want you know, how do you get there and how do you achieve it? Okay. And what's one um, book that's had a tremendous impact on you in your journey? I got to tell you, man. So uh, the book that I'm loving the most right now is a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It is a phenomenal book. I'm raving about it. I'm telling everybody I know to check it out. I, I have it on Audible. I've listened to it twice on Audible and I just ordered the physical version of it. So I'm really about this book. And the reason I like it so much is it is really practical. It's not about goal setting. It's not about all the big picture stuff. What it really is, is very practical. So if you want to lose weight, it breaks down the moments of decision that 
will help you do that. And essentially, he talks about making a vote for the kind of person you want to be. You know, in every day, you're making actions to make a vote for the type of person you want to be. If you want to be a healthy person, what would a healthy person eat for breakfast? So you know by the time breakfast is so is over, whether or not you made a vote to be a healthy person or not. So it's not saying you're on a diet or you're healthy and all that stuff. It's really about just recognizing that you have a lot of moments of decisions where you can vote to be the type of person who eats healthy, or you can vote against that, you know, and making sure that you don't conflict with those two things. Fantastic. And John, you've dropped a lot of, you know, knowledge bombs today. We really appreciate you being very transparent. I'm sure if our folks are going to want to reach out to you. Uh, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, the easiest thing is email john at kasmancapital.com. That's the easiest thing. I am also on LinkedIn. So you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, John, it's been great having you on the show. You Again, you've really gave our audience something, a lot to chew on and think about and also implement. So really appreciate that and you coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. We trust that you enjoyed today's show. Visit archcapital.ventures to learn more about how you can leverage real estate investing to improve your life through passive income, financial freedom, and generational wealth.